It's a quiet bench. I'm impressed, or or something. <laughs> good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, all. Hey. All right. Ready to rock hey, and roll. Good to be back on the Thursdays. It's been a while. Excuse me a moment. Yay. Oh, except I don't hear anybody. Oh, there we go. Check, check. <sighs> Hello. Good morning, Hi. West Coast. I always think that's actually Mark sitting there and I realize, oh no, wait, that's his avatar. <laughs> oh, look, he's not wearing a blanket after all. <laughs> we can't hear you, you're muted. I still have about three layers of uh, <laughs> sweater and t-shirt. Really? Yeah. Well, spring has sprung in Portland, Oregon, that's for sure. No. Still you and me here. The rain last night, probably. Hmm. It was a good news. Good news. Rain. Some more rain, please. Yeah. One of the nice things about Portland, Oregon, is that we're not in the drought zone. No, definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> um, Just to mention super quick, I'm here for 30 minutes. Um, yes. if, to the extent there's a queue, I would love to say hi before that. So. That sounds awesome. And we should mention that if you, uh, well, I'll wait a second to, to, to say this, but uh, in, in, mean, in the meantime, I'm finding our OGM calls channel in Mattermost so that I can be in our chat properly. Um, and we should, oops, copy link. There we go. Um, thank you, the Garden of Earthly Delights, right? Um, oh, good, Pete, thank you very much for putting the old chat channel in the, in the Zoom chat, that is lovely. I was just okay. trying to do that. Um, so we're realizing that the Thursday calls are getting a tiny bit bigger uh, to the point where we don't make it through the room uh, during check-in. Uh, part of the reason for this is that we're leisurely in our check-in and we sort of intentionally take highways and byways along the way. If we were to set a timer and say everybody gets two minutes or whatever, we probably would make it through the room. Uh, but that's um, but that's not, you know, that's not what we're aiming for. We're actually sort of aiming for uh, mixing around our ideas and our achievements and uh, all the kinds of things that we're aiming at. Uh, so, uh, one very, very simple protocol I'd love to put in. Reggie Watts is so brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, Reggie Watts is the house band for one of the new late night talk shows. I'm forgetting which one. No way. Way. He is. Damn, he is I'm going to have to watch TV now, really? He is the, he is the Doc Severance and one of the late night talk shows, and I've forgotten which That's one. That's crazy. Of course, probably only two guy. people on this call remember Doc Severance. No, actually, probably four or five people on this call remember yeah. Doc Severance. <laughs> Um, yeah. Uh, so thanks for so, that heads up. If you if you find that, then uh, uh, easy to find. Yeah, you know, the, the, the band leaders on all those shows are actually pretty cool now. Yeah, they've gotten they've they've realized that that music is an important component of everything, and uh, and it goes there. Um, an aside on that, before I talk more about the protocol, um, <laughs> yeah. we've been watching the PBS series The Black Church. Hmm. Uh, which is four one hours. Uh, it's actually two two hour uh, chunks that you can watch for free on YouTube. And uh, I thought I was reasonably informed on things. No, not really. Uh, it's beautiful and it goes way deep into the role of religion uh, in the black community and how it interacted with the rest of society. And it brings lots of people in and it has an all-star cast of interviewees. Uh, it's really beautiful. So highly recommend it. Related to that, if you haven't seen it, check out Senator Warnock's uh, um, freshman speech at the Senate yesterday. Oh, didn't even know about it. Thank you. 
Yeah, and apparently it's a big, the freshman speech is a big deal. People say this is the best one they've heard in ages. And it's a man who's, who's, who's a preacher, as well as an activist, as well as a senator, you know, he's got the pulpit at what used to be Martin Luther King's church. Yeah. And to hear the, 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 the rhetoric and cadence of that discipline show up in a political discourse, uh, <laughs> the heart that it brings is remarkable. Um, My second with this show. Jerry. If uh, someone can find a link and put it in the chat, that would be fabulous. I'm pretty sure it's online. Uh, John, if you could mute your mic a little bit, that will help us. Mm -hmm. uh, perfect, thank you. And Joe, we are actually chatting in Mattermost, and I don't know if you're on the Mattermost uh, server. So most of our chat, because we want the chat to live on uh, between sessions and to be visible for everybody, you know, whenever, uh, we've actually tried to move ourselves over to Mattermost. And just as an interface tip for anybody who's on a Mac in Chrome or something like that, um, I, there's a little, when you mouse over the buttons to minimize your window, uh, it's usually red, yellow, green. The green mouse button has choices to go uh, window, tile window to left, tile window to right. And I've discovered that uh, opening Mattermost and tiling Mattermost off to the right and leaving Zoom then to the left gives me the ability to kind of replace the Zoom chat and still see everybody. So if you want to try that out, uh, I recommend it. What do you zoom over? So I'm uh, I'm basically in Mattermost, and then yeah. I, I I mouse over the three share, little. Share your screen real quick, Trey. Oh, good idea. Uh, actually, if I share my screen, the zoom won't show up. Oh yes, it should. Oh no, it won't. Uh, the Mattermost will. The That's right. The Mattermost will, which is what matters most. Except it just blew over to the left and didn't. Uh, it just <laughs> it just completely blew my arrangement. That's really great. Anyway, the the, the buttons are these, George. Yeah, okay, got it. Uh, so right now, if I click exit full screen, it'll undo what I just did. But I, what I did was I tiled window to right of screen. And what it does is it, it splits my screen in half, puts Mattermost on the right as a nice chat, and then puts all the zoom on the left, which works fine. <laughs> now let's see if, if I stop sharing, let's see if it'll recover. Nope, did not recover. Okay, let's go back to Mattermost and let's do that again. Ba -ba -da -ba. Now I have to exit full screen and then go back in. Cool. So the thing I was trying to say about our protocols is um, that we uh, we are getting big enough that we don't make it around the room in our normal check-in routine, which is intentionally a leisurely routine. We're taking our time to listen to what everybody's saying and help one another and so forth. Uh, and this hasn't grown to such a big call yet either. But um, I kind of want to say that it's okay if we don't uh, hit everybody, but there are some people who would love to check in or be heard. So um, ping me, say so in the chat. I will make sure that we include you early in the process, and that will be uh, that will be a simple simple workaround for that right now. Uh, and then we're, we're working on other things. What we don't want to do is mess up uh, sort of the the nature, tone, quality of uh, of the calls. Um, and so in this way, we can sort of still be leisurely and uh, hopefully not hurt feelings and make it through. Um, and then I, my normal MO is to start from the bottom of my screen, just this is just a photo call that started early, but I realized that you know, Doug, for example, and Craig have ended up way at the end of the list over and over and over again. So maybe I'll start with, uh, with you guys after, uh, after Charles because Charles has to leave quickly. And uh, that way we'll make sure that we, we catch your ideas uh, sort of earlier in the call. Um, and then Pete, you, you always do a fantastic job of organizing like activities that OGM is and checking us in on those. Uh, so I'll make sure that I catch you early in the loop also. Um, so that being and one said, more thing, we're, yes. we have a hard stop at uh, 9, 9.30. Um, and we have to, we have a hard stop at 9.30. So we're, we're going to aim to wrap the call uh, like two minutes before 9.30. So we have a chance to, to swap to our next, next conference. Thank you. Um, and I am right now, um, so I, I also sent in today's invite and the idea that if any of you feel like taking notes um, and um, sharing them with us. You could use a virtual camera and actually share them in your background. You could actually use a piece of gear that lets you do switching and so forth. Our friend David Bovill has been using those in meetings, which is pretty impressive. It's a $100 switcher basically that lets you then uh, put whatever you want behind you in, in different ways and configurations. I do not have one of those, uh, but, it's easy, but it's easy enough to get one of these virtual cameras and then show us uh, you know, your, your outliner, your mind mapper, your brain, your Kumu, uh, also even your iPad drawing. So if you were using Procreate or uh, paper or some other tool on, on the iPad and we're just drawing what we're doing, you could show that to us behind you. And then it's up to anybody to just pin uh, you 
uh, up on, on, on their screen. And uh, I think that'll work out as well. And then final thing is I'm busy writing, but not quite done, an invite for tomorrow morning, same time. Uh, we're gonna do a pop-up, uh, just an, a one-off call for OGM because we're redoing the OGM website. And uh, one of the things that, that we would love to have there is the voices of OGMers. We would love to have, you know, uh, what is this like for you? And uh, uh, so I, I'm, I'm wording that now and we'll send that out shortly, uh, sort of uh, around midday today. But uh, if you'd like to, please plan to join us tomorrow at 8 a.m. Pacific again uh, for just, a, I think it'll be an hour. We could run over if it's really good, really getting good, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, and so Charlotte, um, if you, so the tools aren't familiar, I think what we can do is we can pretty quickly create a, a, a little resource page that has links to many cam. Mm -hmm. There's a series of virtual cams that you can use. Uh, there's also one open source one that of course looks like Windows 95, but, but is free uh, that I found that I have not tried. Uh, but the other ones usually charge like $30 once or something like that. Um, some of them are actually subscriptions, like mm -hmm, went to $15 a month, which seems to me kind of expensive for that. Um, and we haven't tried the Zoom whiteboard here, uh, but doesn't the whiteboard take over our display? Don't know. Okay, so we have not experimented with a Zoom whiteboard. That is a good idea to try at some point because we are kind of a visual practice here. Um, any other business before we launch in? I think we're good. So Charles, since you've got a, a boogie at the at the half, please uh, if we'll start. Why don't we start with Charles, Doug, Pete? Wow, thank you for the honor of kicking it off here. And uh, I've been away for a while. Um, I'll try to be brief, but just for kind of action-packed updates, so kind of bursting at the seams. Um, so the main reason I've been away is because I was in the Kernel Fellowship. That's kernel.community. I could put that in the chat, but I'm on my phone at the moment in my kitchen trying to get some food. But um, so that's a web three decentralized web um, around Ethereum blockchain fellowship that Lauren and Yon and I have been in, um, in a kind of eight week program, but it continues as a community network. So lots more to say about that. Anyone can can uh, connect with me um, if they're interested. Um, so yeah, I shared the Reggie Watts piece, which I was just watching before and it's just, I hadn't seen that particular performance, um, but the, uh, the uh, it's the NPR Tiny Desk. And um, so he has a song in there that's uh, where he, he the, the, the intro is like he's referring to, to Nipper, NPR is Nipper. And then he goes on to talk about, you know, the perfect coffee sips from all the moderators that he's listened to for years on NPR. And I just kind of tuned into this OGME vibe. So I thought I would share that, um, but it's, and it's a really cool song anyway. Um, KeyCollab, the Collective Intelligence Collaboratory. Um, group IQ, this is the big uh, uh, kind of front and center focus uh, now starting, we, we have these Monday sessions. I'll, um, I'm excited, uh, I'm not gonna go into all detail because there's too much, but every, every week everybody's invited. Um, and we're gonna be, um, for the next uh, bunch of weeks, so over a month probably, really focusing each session incrementally in how do we um, actually build that conversation, that container to have a summit around group IQ, how to measure group intelligence. And it's a big topic. Um, and actually, I just realized today, I want to break it into a kind of five elements um, uh, mode. So that's just uh, um, heard it here first. Actually, Lauren hasn't even heard that. Um, uh, and the other thing is, it's the return of the flow show. So I'll be taking over starting Monday and we'll be doing a flow show style, which um, some of you know what that means. Um, Lauren is not here because she's off and running interviewing systems innovators um, in a series, um, asking them how we're gonna build this amazing incubator that we're trying to do with Kiko Lab. And um, she's also leading the um, charge to manage a whole bunch of consultants, teams of consultants coming on board Kiko Lab to support our various projects. And um, in regard to systems innovators, I think lastly, I'll just say Vincent, Arena and I, and Alex Kennedy um, have been doing a bunch of things on Clubhouse. Systemsinnovators.com is a place to get information about that and also Telegram and Discord. And um, I just have to give a shout out to Pete Kaminsky and Flotilla and uh, lots and lots of things kicking off there. So thanks everyone, much love. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, and there's just, um, 
we have intersections with lovely initiatives like Kiko Lab, and lots of people from OGM have been showing up for Kiko Lab calls and vice versa. And then there's a lot of sort of cross breeding and, and thinking and DNA swapping uh, between our different groups and infrastructure building. Uh, and that feels really, really nice. It's, uh, it's I think it's very OGM y. It's, it's, it's what we're aiming for. And when we talk about um, I, what I sort of, I just don't like the term onboarding. Onboarding feels like what you do to like bring a dog onto a ship in a crate or something. It's like, uh, um, so so introduction introductions dating. I don't know what the what the right word. Uh, is. Allow me just to quickly chime in because Please. actually on onboarding is super relevant. I mean, whether you like the term or not, we've done so before. Well, going back already almost two months, we because of the aforementioned consultants, they're actually interns coming through various universities, but these are like high, highly trained, experienced um, grad students in all different you know, sectors. And so we're calling them consultants, but essentially we had to like let them know what's up with Kiko Lab, which is not a simple thing because as one of them put it sort of off the cuff, you know, we're an abstract organization or abstract company, you know, we're not even a company. So what, anyway, I digress, but onboarding. So there's some mural boards that uh, Lauren has put marvelously together, really visually laying out the onboarding processes and protocols. Okay, that's it, thanks. <laughs> awesome, Charles. I just put in the chat, maybe you're an abstract expressionist organization. Uh, there's, there's some genre of, of abstraction. Um, awesome, so uh, thank you very much. Let's go to uh, Doug, then Pete, then Craig. Well, this, of course, is very strange going this early in the queue. <laughs> Usually I fall off the end when I have so much to say. I'm feeling rather quiet this morning. Uh, two things on my mind. I'm involved with a group that thinks its uh, mission is to reinvent government. And what they're working on right now is taking the new stimulus package, the whole 1.9 trillion, and saying as a system, feedback is missing. So what they're looking at is taking uh, groups of people like VISTA vo uh, volunteers, maybe the people who did the census and deputizing them as local uh, feedback loops uh, on how the uh, whole spreading money around so widely is happening. Is it happening? What needs to happen? Uh, it's quite interesting because it's actually a plausible project and I have some leverage to maybe get it done. Uh, the thing that's probably most on my mind is, uh, Jerry, you began last week by saying climate change is on the horizon. And I bristled at that because to me, we're in climate change. It's not coming, it's here and we're not doing very much about it. I think that people have no idea really what to do to get off of the logic of win-win, which is where we seem to be. That is, you know, the entrepreneurs can win, uh, green can win, everybody can win. When the fact is we've got to cut CO2 and there's no plan to cut it rapidly enough to make a significant difference. Uh, without actually uh, unemploying people or uh, losing jobs or communities. So the conversation is not engaged with uh, the strategic reality. And I don't know how to help it get there, but it's, uh, we've got to do better. Um, two thoughts and then I'll open it to the floor. One, uh, and one I just forgot. Um, Partly there's, there's um, the alternatives for what to do are just sort of uh, unclear to people. Like, like we're frozen in time because this is present. It's like, it's, it's already hit us. Um, but I think uh, people are frozen for what to do. And, and, and we're kind of not able to get into that conversation very easily. Um, so I, I totally agree. Klaus, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I totally agree with, with Doug's statement. Stay off. Um, it is to me stunning, for example, it's citizen climate lobby, business climate leaders. These are people who are really focusing on climate change and they're talking about it and they're researching it. And <clears throat> yet even here, uh, there is a lack of understanding uh, for, for uh, agriculture, uh, res restoring nature back to health and focusing on the ecosystem as the short-term go-to place. 
that that really solves uh, these questions of employment, community, and so on. In the process of fixing agriculture, we would fix community if we go into regenerative agriculture. I just got green lighted by business climate leaders to develop a webinar that is focused on uh, looking at agriculture in total. You know, looking at uh, what what does the science really say? Because there is all this misinformation uh, that is being inserted into the marketplace. You know, uh, what is the reliability of carbon sequestration into soil? How long will it stay there? Um, is this really working? Can you feed people? Is it going to plummet yields and so on and so on? So we're working with the uh, Soil Health Institute and the Rodale Institute assigned a consultant to me to, uh, to develop a structure you know, where we can have, where we can confidently send our volunteers to work with members of Congress and say, here's the science, here's how this works. Because the window of opportunity to do something here is really closing rapidly. Um, Klaus, thank you. I remembered as you were talking, the thing I wanted to say, which just like escaped my head, which was that even a pandemic, which cut almost all air travel and tons of other travel and everything else couldn't bring our, our carbon consumption levels down to the level that experts think we need to get to, uh, to get, you know, to get to the right, uh, you know, to, to prevent disaster. So, uh, so Greta Thunberg's uh, voice that says, hey, we need to be on a war footing about this isn't being heard. And then, and then Klaus, when, when I hear you talk about climate and, and what, I, what I know about regenerative agriculture and all of that, I'm like, yes, yes, got it. Why don't we just do that really fast? And then I just finished reading a, a thread this morning about sort of managing solar uh, albedo and a whole bunch of other sorts of things as being the only and, and fastest and most important way to manage climate change. And I'm like, I'm not so sure about that one. I think that there's unintended consequences left, right, and center from that. And I would be, I would need to be convinced that that's the most important thing. And I've read a few things here and there. So just like any, any lay person who's sitting here staring at this and, and agrees that the problem is current, completely present is likely confused about what the alternatives look like. And I think one way we might be helpful is in expressing that dilemma and then showing what the alternatives might be and helping people who've got the best arguments to sort our way through some of those things and what to do. Well, I mean, last week, it really hit me how the entire investment strategy, you know, hedge funds and uh, banks and so on, are betting on solar, electric cars, you know, and then sequestration strategies. There is now general acceptance uh, in the business community that sequestration has to be part of the game, all right? It's too late, it's already out there, it needs to come back down. But the ideas of how to do this are ridiculous, right? I mean, they, they, they are they're all untested technologies. We don't know what the side effects will be, whereas you have nature uh, ready to go, instantly scale up, right? But the disruptions to a trillion dollar sector of the economy will be significant, right? And so there is this, you know, how much time do we have to argue over this? And this is, this is uh, getting really intense. Exactly, thank you, Gil. Yeah, um, um, uh, Doug and Klaus, very provocative and thank you for this. I'm, I'm struck, Jerry, that not only has the pandemic not brought the carbon emissions down, but it hasn't galvanized unified global action. Although it has actually much more than we, you know, than, than it might have, but not as much as we had hoped. Uh, you know, getting getting vaccines as quickly as we did is remarkable, even though there's failures in distribution. Uh, Klaus, I'm struck listening to you at the at the the layers in this conversation. Um, you know, there's there's the stuff that is easy to do, technologically feasible, economic right now, uh, which proceeds very quickly in some regions and doesn't in others. There are things that are complex and have much inter interdependencies, like you're talking about. Um, there's the um, there's the disinformation and noise in the system. There's also the you know the entrenched economic interests. You know we know the fossil fuel industry needs to go away. That's a massive industry and massively subsidized, and there's enormous political power concentrated around it. So you have everything from culture and lifestyle to worldview and interpretation to technology and feasibility and implementation issues, which folks like you know Saul Griffith have, have dealt with, I think, very well. Um, and, uh, and the political apparatus behind that and the con concentrations of capital behind that. 
Uh, each of these is a different sort of problem. They're interconnected, obviously, but the, the, they don't yield to the same kinds of approaches. And I haven't seen anybody really untangle that uh, in a thorough way. And maybe, Jerry, that could be part of the exercise you're proposing for us here. So, so we're, we're in the regenerative movement. Um, I'm working really hard to focus the attention on the, the, the food service industry. You know, if because you have farmers who get the who get it, you know they understand that uh, the climate is changing and that it's really dangerous for them. You get consumers who have health concerns, uh, uh, nutritional value concerns. Mm -hmm. In the middle, you have a supply chain that refuses to budge. So, to there are only two options: either you have the supply chain start to collaborate and come on board, or you have to develop uh, walkaround mechanisms. Uh, to force a change into the system. Yeah. Um, one thing that occurs to me, and I think this sort of is buried in uh, what I try to bring to our approach, as, and so far as we have an, an OGM approach, is something like Donella Meadows' um, points for the points of leverage for changing a system, and um, coupled with Russ Acoff, who was sort of a mentor of mine and one of the early systems thinkers, saying there is no such thing as a problem; there are systems of problems, and they all kind of interact. And in order to solve things, sometimes you need to tweak here, tweak there, change this, change that, not just, you know, not just do one thing. And therefore, how might we help all the people who are tweaking at the different layers in the, of the problem on the different levers that make a lot of sense? And how do we connect their efforts? How do we sort of help amplify and, and uh, collimate their energies in some sense? Um, and so, so doing, doing something everywhere seems to me to be uh, a pretty useful way to get there and helping people sort to the most functional thing they can do locally seems really important, um, especially given the, the nexus of, you know, I've got a thought in my brain that says we, we are currently in, in five crises, right? And, and be wary of the folks who say, this is the one solution to everything. Right. Solar albedo management is the, is the one answer. It just makes, makes my skin rise. And I'm, I'm like, I, bah. Uh, the, 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 the geoengineering thing makes me a little, a little um, crazy. Actually, right on cue, I just put a big thing in the, in the chat um, exactly about that. And the Kiko Lab uh, visitation, dot, dot, dot. And it was yeah. the Kiko Lab conversation that sparked me on, on solar albedo management and all that, solar radiation management. Yes. It was, yeah, uh, it's huge, huge topic. Thanks. Yep. Thanks. Um, so let's go to Pete, Craig, and Jack. Um, thank you, Jerry. Uh, it's wonderful to see everybody. Um, uh, I have to report out something which I don't want to, <clears throat> but today, for whatever reason, I've got a pit in my stomach uh, as, as I, um, let me let me start off by saying um, some of my best friends are pale skinned older man, men. I, I, some of them are actually pretty cool. Um, uh, and I'm one myself. Uh, I'm super sad today for whatever reason. <laughs> We're too many pale skinned people and too many men people. Um, and it makes me really sad. And I agree um, with that. Thank you for um, thank you, Judy, for being here. Um, thank you, Linda. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Charlotte, for joining us. Yeah. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I, I it's not too many, but too few of everybody else. Yeah. I don't, I don't well want well said. Away. Well said. Um, uh, which, which means that if each of us invited someone who isn't like us into these calls, we would, we could solve this. So I, I, I actually, I've, I've wondered that for a long time and I thought that was a, I, my guess is that's a, a simple, a simple, and yet maybe perhaps naive answer. Um, initial that's conditions. My style. It's a good style, um, uh, but I, I wonder a lot about initial conditions and and how to dig yourself out of a hole and things like that. Um, um, especially when, you know, this, despite our our monoculturalness, we're actually doing some good work in the world, I think. Um, so not, we're not perfect, but um, anyway, so let me, let me move on from that. Thanks for letting me vent. Um, uh, I just want to talk about a couple of things today. Um, we are still in preview and planning uh, mode. So this is almost too early to, to talk about on the call, except it's not quite. Um, uh, we had our first two uh, OGM wiki um, preview and planning calls this week, and they went pretty well. Um, 
to kind of recap, you'll see this in um, the mailing list and on the forum and on the OJM Wiki channel if you want to join uh, in um, in Mattermost. Um, uh, we're super excited. Uh, we're super jazzed about the the platform that that we think we can build OGM Wiki on. So that's kind of where we've got the energy to work on an OGM Wiki. Um, uh, the platform is coming along. It's still clunky and hard to use and, and not very fun. Um, unless you start using it, then it's super fun. Uh, but um, I, I don't want to kind of oversell where we are. But um, we are starting to talk about kind of you know what we would use a wiki for um, if we would use a wiki uh, and how that would work. So um, I'll I'll keep having calls. I'll probably schedule one or two for next week sometime. Send out an email again, um, and would love to have you. And don't feel like you're missing out if you don't feel like attending or can't make it or whatever. Um, it's going to be a long process of kind of coming together in, into wiki mindset and and uh, an OGM wiki. So. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is I, a few of us keep mentioning this on calls, uh, um, but uh, it's it's still it's coalescing nicely. I think um, uh, obviously there's this wonderful OGM community which has these fuzzy boundaries and is a community uh, of attraction is the way I think of it. Um, uh, so we don't have hard boundaries on the OGM community and people kind of like. Um, participate peripherally and sometimes you know uh, so we have coalescences of different kinds that do different things um, some of them are kind of within OGM like free Jerry's brain some of them are next door like CSC or uh, flotilla um, uh, another concentration that we've got going and that we've been working on for for months now but um, another concentration that we've got going is a, is what we're calling a stewardship stewardship team stewardship council something like that there's actually a channel um uh, ogm stewards i think something like that um uh and kind of the output or the charter or the mission for uh, that team is partly to help ogm be a, an amazing community and partly to take a particular concentration and make it um structured enough so that it can meet up with the rest of of the world in a in a kind of legal and financial sense so what if we had something that i i'm going to use foundation as a word it, that that's maybe not the right word or the right name but what if we had a, an ogm foundation that was a more structured thing that could meet up with um, other um, other entities in a more formal way um, when that's needed um, and maybe what if some of those entities were possibly um, uh, partners in making the world a better place, um, possibly partners in finding financing for funding some of the things that we think that we could do as you know, a collective of collectives of collectives. Uh, so uh, we're continuing to kind of focus that mission and we're pretty far along. We feel good about it. Um, if you're interested in more, want to know more, um, feel free to, to hop over to the Steward channel and chat with us. Um, uh, we normally don't bite um, and we're normally reasonably friendly um, and we'd be happy to have you. And so more news in the next, you know, weeks, uh, weeks and maybe just weeks, actually, weeks and months, maybe just weeks. We'll see. Thanks. Um, awesome, Pete. Thank you. Uh, that was great. Uh, Craig, Jack, Linda. Hello, everyone. Greetings. As always, it's uh, absolutely super to be here, always inspiring and uh, relaxing too, funnily enough, <laughs> relaxing to discuss all these uh, serious issues that we, uh, we go to. Um, as you, many of you will know by now, my main area of endeavor is social media and efforts to, uh, to make it better. Um, so I spend a lot of time reading about what's wrong with it and far too little time in discussions about what it could be doing. Um, and that's kind of the direction I'm trying to take my, my thought processes, my uh, creativity. I'm trying to push it towards away from so much of what we know of what's wrong with social media and what kind of harms it has done. There are so many. 
they, I mean, they go to the mental health of the population of the planet. It's absolutely awful, something that really needs to be addressed, which is why I'm so passionately involved in it. This week, I came up with a term which gives me a banner to, to promote, a, 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 a banner to, to umbrella the, the, the effort. You can see I'm still, <laughs> I'm still thinking about all of this. And, and, and excited has, about it, which is cool. And the banner has come from my parallel interest in uh, regenerative, regenerative agriculture. I've come up with regenerative social media which I absolutely love. So um, it's probably the same for everybody. If you Google regenerative social media, you get absolutely zilch. You get, what you do get is uh, pages about, uh, or links to pages about regenerative medicine and the social media pages, which are used to promote those services. So there's, a, I believe I've actually coined this term, regenerative social media. So I'm just excited about that. And it gives me, it starts to give me, uh, uh, to put form on, uh, on, on these endeavors, which uh, I'm trying to move forward with. Um, what I really need from the people around me is uh, feedback and some conversation about, about what is good with social media and how that could be better and what is missing from social media, which social media would be better if it had. That kind of thing is all, uh, uh, you know, these original ideas. I have a few, but I have a... I have only my one brain, so. Uh, but now you anything, have multi minds with you, so. Any suggestions anyone can come up with about what social media could be doing to to heal itself and heal the uh, emotional life of the people in the world, more than more than welcome. I have one tiny suggestion, which is an essay I mean to write. It's sort of open in a tab in my way too many tabs browser. Uh, and basically, the, it, it, it tries to address the question I just put in the Mattermost chat, chat, which is, what if Facebook had designed this platform for citizens instead of consumers? Yeah. How might, how might Facebook have been different? What would the proper affordances be to support citizenship, citizenry, um, uh, the needs of citizens to work together and collaborate, all those kinds of things, instead of the algorithms to increase, maximize screen time and engagement and spin us into craziness? Um, right, yeah, and, yeah. and and spy on us and sell off our data and all those other good things that uh, that we've now seemed to normalize somehow. But um, um, maybe um, I don't, are you on the Mattermost or the Discourse forum? I'm on Mattermost. Um, maybe what we do is we set up find a, a good place for that conversation so we can sort of participate asynchronously between our calls and see who shows right, up yeah. and how we can help. That would that's actually sort of maybe one way. Um, anybody else with a thought? I think that we're all like in the middle or submerged in the media. And so the idea of, of making it better sounds really appealing to me or we're, we're busy swimming in this. Yeah, there is a, there is a, a, a large and very active global community of tech people, sociologists, psychologists, teachers, educators, all kinds of knowledgeable people who are very, very concerned about the harms of social media. And there's a lot of talk and discussion about, about what it shouldn't be doing, but not so very much about what it should be doing. And that's, that's where I want to take it. Thank you. Um, it strikes me, Jerry, that you actually said that last week. You posed that question last week. What if oh, Facebook good. had, I forget had what been I designed as a, as a platform for citizens that instead mm -hmm. of consumers? You did. And that has fallen through the cracks on my desk. I'll tell you what I'll try to do. I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep this promise. I'm going to make a note of that. I'm pulling it out of Mattermost now. And I'll think about it myself and put some specific effort into uh, answering that question. That sounds lovely. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Joe, did you want to jump in? And I think Leo also? Um, to some extent, yeah, I just wanted to raise my hand for Leo, actually. Uh, oh, good. 
Yeah, but um, yeah, I think this is I think the second time in in a year that I've been on. I think it's the first time ever that Leo's been on. So I just thought it'd be good to to, to acknowledge that. Uh, but yeah, over to Leo. We had a great conversation in the podcast also. So this is more changing the topic, but it had a little bit of a link with the regenerative social media, like maybe the stuff we were talking about in our after after party after our podcast session was regenerative social media just by any other name. Um, and we were also excited. We yeah stayed for hours talking about it. But yeah, maybe maybe over to Leo. Awesome, thank you, Leo. Yeah, sure. Can you, uh, you can, can uh, sorry? Can you confirm that you can hear me properly? Because I I did switch from being on a train to uh, being here in my flat. And so can you hear me loud and clear? You look like you're the host of a radio show. You're coming through five by five, as the <laughs> radio people say. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, sorry for making it late to the meeting today, but uh, I was invited by Jerry and and Jeff uh, based on our interaction last Friday. So uh, my name is Leo, Leo VVA. I'm a software engineer, I suppose. It's uh, the exercise of presenting myself. It's always a little weird because it feels like uh, it has evolved quite a lot in the last three to four years or so. Um, but uh, I'm based in France, and occasionally I am French, and you will sometimes hear me speak French, although you might not realize that it's actually me talking. Um, I'm, uh, I'm working mostly in free software development. I'm, right now I'm working with a contract with the French government, but uh, on the side, and what is of interest to all of you here, is that I work on a free software implementation of the Rome research paradigm. And the software is called OrgRome. It is based uh, within Emacs on stuff like Org Mode and uh, other fancy tools you might have heard about. And I've been working on the project for a year, um, you know, based on the exchange that I, I've had with uh, Jerry and Jeff, you know, there seems to be plenty of overlap. Oh, sorry. Uh, did I say Jeff? I mean, Pete, sorry. <laughs> um, and, you know, we had plenty of, uh, plenty of overlap between what I wanted to do with my software, what um, everyone else wanted to do with their software. And we thought it would be interesting for me to join you uh, since this seems to be a conglomerate of people interested in very um, uh, nebulous but yet related topics. So I'm glad to be here. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions for the presentation, I suggest you ask them now. And then I'll move on to a question on uh, social medias because I think I might have some insight on this. Sounds great, please. So any question regarding to what I'm doing? I'm not sure if I'm making a cogent job of presenting myself. I'm not trained enough for this yet. I think you did great. I put a link to you in my brain in the chat so people can follow that and see more context. And I just realized that you weren't connected to Orgrom, so I'm trying to explain Orgrom in the chat. Anybody else have thoughts or questions? I think we're good. I think, I think we sort of get to know each other through the conversations about topics. So um, go ahead and jump in about, uh, about social media if you want. Yeah, so... Uh... I think the idea of social media is very interesting to me because um, uh, with the, within the Emacs um, ecosystem, I would say, uh, I tend to be focused on community and how to foster such a sense within a community. You know, I, uh, I am one of the organizers of the Emacs conference, which happened last edition in November. And we have a proximity to the community. We're trying to see how do we you know, develop relationship between users, but also how do we develop relationship between developers and users, developers to developers, developers to community people, community people, et cetera, et cetera, all the possible permutations you can think of. And somehow at no point during this discussion or this reflection, the word social media was used, maybe because it is su such a um, acneed term. And whenever you, you think of social media, you think of all the negative aspects. So. I guess I'm first interested in this healing aspect of social media, but maybe what I'd like to ask uh, under this light would be how exactly, what do we keep within social media and what do we leave off? And so something a little more involved of an answer than just remove the negative algorithm and keep what's good, because I think that's a question that warrants a little bit of investigation. So that's my question, if that makes sense. Please, anybody want to take a swing? Or Craig? That is sure. my question too. That is Excellent. my question too. What, what do we uh, um, what do we keep? I think we keep what we what we know is uh, and and have experienced has been positive and and valuable, and we get rid of everything that we have already identified, which is uh, is is damaging and detrimental to society. Um, I would like to see a, a, 
as I wrote something yesterday, can I just, I, I thought this was, uh, I, I felt good about writing it. So let me just read it off quickly. Uh, would be a, a, a positive, would be a pro prolifer proliferation, excuse me, of social apps and websites which promote the positive, the factual, the educational, the intelligent, which promotes the value of critical thinking, which attracts millions of people into discussions and debates, raises the collective appreciation of healthy and sustainable social, industrial, and commercial solutions, and which reduces the dismayingly widespread tendency towards the egotistical, the narcissistic, the dismissive, the combative, and the downright ignorant. So you just want to change human nature. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> that would be that would be nice too, but perhaps too too high a goal and well uh, out with the scope outside the scope of of, uh, of what I'm attempting to do. Um, to to stop social media being so negative and destructive. Is, is one side of the equation. And the other side is to regenerate social media such that it becomes positive, positive, positive. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, if I may just have a quick question on this. Go ahead, Leo. Uh, just bouncing back on what you've said. Uh, obviously when social media was designed, uh, now it might have not been done in such an elo eloquent rent as you did right now, but I'm pretty sure the objectives were as noble uh, at the start. So I think the question then becomes, if we have an example, example of something that went wrong and something that you know, colonized all of our lives and especially our children's life, well, maybe not me, I know they're young, but your children, uh, what are the checks that we need to implement so that the new system that we develop does not end up being corrupted in the same way as the former one, if that makes sense. And we have a lot of hands up. And also, I just want to say that we, um, uh, we are unlikely to solve this problem in this discussion. So I just want to go lightly over the topic. And then actually, what I can do is uh, collect up the people with interest, Craig, and hand them off to you to host a, a conversation of your own, uh, and so forth. So um, yeah, super. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So let, let's go. Uh, if you can uh, drop in, Vincent, you had your hand up. Uh, then uh, Doug, then George, and John. So, sorry, if you were in the two. Go ahead. Yeah. The, the thanks, Jerry. Um, yeah. The question that came into my head uh, when Leo and Craig you were speaking is. Are we a reflection of our social media or is our social media a reflection of us? Um, and I think that's an interesting thing where some people are like, oh, pe like people are just like, like, you know, how people are on Facebook is just a reflection of human nature versus the system actually affects how we behave enough. I think it's both. Um, and I also have been thinking about like seeing my friends that are deleting Facebook and asking myself, why don't I delete Facebook? And it's because there is a lot of utility to it that for me overweighs the negative, including knowing what's going on with those you care about, being connected to opportunities that you otherwise would not have if you were not on social media, and also occasionally to sort of uh, solve boredom. Um, but like, so there are some main kind of reasons I feel like people don't delete Facebook or other apps because of the negatives and maybe we just need to have more like focused services that can kind of meet those needs. And maybe those things that meet boredom or meet connecting people to opportunities are not even social media. Um, but I think we need to figure out how to replace the positive before we can get rid of the negative. Um, thanks, Vincent. Uh, uh, I had George, Doug, uh, John, and then we'll go back to our queue. I, I think it's largely a matter of how social media is used. It's so flexible. It, it, it's so flexible that, you know, in, in 2008, when I wrote my book on word of mouth, I spent a month because the social media had just been invented hmm. uh, on social media. And it was the worst month of my life. And I never really went back to it till about eight or nine months ago when I reactivated my participation in Twitter. And it was also awful, but there was enough 
good people in there that I, what I learned to do is curate my feed and drop the political stuff and use lists to drop people into lists and then unfollow them. Anyway, through a lot of curating and, and careful selection, it became a completely different thing. Hmm. Um, I've got only really intelligent people who are constructive and it's just a wonderful feed. And I've just eliminated, I've got one for instance called platitudes. And everybody who spouts platitudes, you get about two platitudes, two or three platitudes with me. You, you know, by your third platitude, you're on my platitude list because I don't want to you know, eliminate people. It, it doesn't feel right. So I put them on the platitude list and then I unfollow them. And then I never look at the platitude list unless I want to write a humorous tweet <laughs> about platitudes. Then boy, do I have a collection of platitudes. So, so, so with, with careful, my point is, I think I've already made that, 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 you know, Facebook and Twitter and all these things can be used very constructively. There are some wonderful people, and many of you people are on Twitter. Uh, there, there, there are some wonderful people who are enormously constructive, very supportive with DMs and behind the scenes and getting onto Zoom calls and all that. Um, so it really, I think a, a more, realistic and, and, and achievable goal, Craig, might be to kind of change it from the inside. Uh, there are a lot of people who are actively talking on Twitter about you know this corner of Twitter or that corner of Twitter, or how can we make this corner of Twitter more productive? And I, I, I think that's the way to go to, to, to improve it from the inside rather than invent something something new. Let's go, uh, Doug, John, Charlotte, me, and back to the queue. Thanks. Thanks well, George. I kind of agree with the last comment. I think it's naive to believe we can separate out the good from the bad. I think there are two states of the same thing. And it's a complex interaction of people, their mindsets and desires. Uh, and it's gonna be a social evolution, not a technical fix. Yep. Thank you. And I missed, uh, Mark is also in the queue. I missed him uh, ge uh, gesturing for attention. So let's go, uh, John, Charlotte, Mark, then me. Go ahead, John. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is just a quick, this is quick and dirty sloppy <laughs> idea, but uh, it's an idea. So this would have to be funded, but it's not a huge investment. Uh, but some beneficent funder says, okay, listen, show up, show up with 25 to 50 people uh, by the way, you can't be all white males. <laughs> you know, you, you show up with a somewhat diverse group of 25 to 50 people, and we're going to click you on. And what click you on means is we're going to give you citizen votes. We're going to give you something. It's something like the budget game. We're going to give e everybody here a bunch of votes, and we're going to do some things together. We're not going to decide big issues. We're not going to try to fix climate change, but we're going to do some minor things together that experiment with how we use our votes and use our identification of this is a better idea, this is a not so good idea. And by the way, you can bring people in, it's invitation only. I mean, it starts with that 25 to 50, but you can bring people in, you get rewarded for bringing people in, but they're, they're, when they come in, they're linked to your name, just like Clubhouse. And you basically, you build the good in a greenhouse. You, know, you experiment with this thing. Things will go wrong, I'm sure. You'll, but, but some good stuff that I know happens when people have votes as opposed to dollars, I mean, they have in the budget game, they have dollars, but it's play money dollars. Everybody gets the same amount and they use them in a way that's kind of in between real money and voting. And I've seen that happen a number of times. I've facilitated a whole bunch of these things. So you run something like that. You get it going. If you get a few tribes that are diverse, that have grown up learning how to make increasingly complex decisions, using votes, using identification of this is a better idea. Then you go to a regular social media outlet, might even be Twitter, and you say, hey, we got this active thing over here and it works. Now it could all come into Twitter, but you know, we're gonna have to change the infrastructure so that it can, it can support what they're doing. And uh, not, we'll, 
have to have everybody do this, but it's got to like, this is the greenhouse. You want to come into the greenhouse. This is how it works. And you, you'll receive some votes when you come in. And, but these are the rules you're signing up for when you come in. It's just an idea. I know it's, you know, I can think of, I could knock this idea down myself if I, need, if I needed to, but I just want to put it in to the queue and, you know, help generate other ideas. And uh, by the way, this, this can count as my, my check-in. Um, because the other stuff I'm doing is all doesn't have it's all private. It's writing and helping people and you know nice, but that's all I need to say about it in terms of a check-in. So thank you very much. If anybody wants to follow up on variations on the budget game as social media, please contact me. I'd be happy to work on that. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, John. Thanks, Thanks very much. Uh, let's go, Charlotte. Mark me. And you're muted, Charlotte. Now you're unmuted, perfect. I had three monitors, so I have to figure out which one to activate them. Um, I'm Charlotte Pierce, and um, I've been involved with the Pyragogy Project since one of Howard Rheingold's courses um, I took online, and I have no idea how I found it, but somewhere. <laughs> I think I was looking up my, I was looking up the well because way back in what the seventies or something, there was the well. Do people remember that? I don't think it goes back to the seventies. Or eighties, yeah, eighties. Yeah, yeah. It goes back to early PC days. It was a dial-up yeah. system that used RAM Pico span, and my first email ID was Spiff at Well. And I was trying to remember my first well thing, and I couldn't. I just, I don't know where to find it. I, no. I said, Howard, can you just find it for me? But I mean, the well's still out there. I guess it's, you know, costs quite a bit to join or something now. But I don't know. I um, So we, we got together with the Piragaji group. Uh, you know, we started right away, I think, in 2012, didn't we, Joe? Um, doing live video conferencing on Google Hangouts. And I, I think that's what really brought us together. And that's why I like this forum, you know, it just, it brought people from a lot of different places, walks of life and cultures. We had people from Sri Lanka and Mexico, Ecuador, we had, you know, so I don't know what my point is, but I like this and I'm just trying to um, make you know, help make that project go forward and define some of the patterns that are relevant to people's enterprises and projects, um, make it more practical and, uh, and connect it with, because I, I think silos are like the thing that will bring us all down. <laughs> you know, we get, there's a, Eric Erickson had this concept called pseudo speciation. And we get into these ideas that we're you know, there's another species that we're at war with out there. And I don't think we're going to survive that way. So that's about it. I publish books. I do three pod, three and a half podcasts, including the Pyragogy in Action podcast. And we'd love to kind of cycle through all you, your projects in that podcast eventually. I think that would be a good source of of topics. That'd be awesome. And you and Joe just hosted Pete and me in a, a lovely podcast, which is online. Mm -hmm. um, and let me submit uh, to Craig that the Pyragogy work is probably going to offer you lots and lots of resources. And also, there's the Wise Democracy Pattern Language from Tom Attlee and lots of lots of contributors. Uh, there is the Liberating Structures work from Nancy White and lots of contributors. Uh, and I think each of these has created a body of work about how to make citizens more like how to make how to make us more like citizens and collaborators than consumers and couch potatoes. Uh, so if you're if you're on a quest for how do we make us smarter while using these tools, because these all of these are tool wise approaches, um, I think those would be really, really terrific things to, to get I've to get smart those. on. Sorry. Go ahead, Charlotte. Oh, I, I brought those concepts in that way of working into my own, my other publishing enterprise, you know. So now I just work with authors as partners and it gets messy, you know, it gets messy and people get 
you know, uppity about stuff and they don't want to do this or that without getting paid. And it's, but it's so rewarding. I just don't, I don't, I don't even want to do it without having a collaboration because I feel like my brain is being extended. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love that. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Mark? Yes, nice to see you. Uh, and you're holding the child for ransom behind you, it seems like. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, you were complaining about just having white people on the, on the call. So thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it's a popo uh, also because that's, that's what I've been doing for the last eight years is to work with um, indigenous communities, mostly in the Amazon. Um, and my activities were kind of a stop. <laughs> I mean, actually my, my traveling there went to a stop. Um, when, when COVID started, um, the amazing thing that, that, that happened with um, COVID is um, a return to, for a lot of tribes in the Amazon to traditional medicines it was a, a big, big thing. And, and uh, what I have observed is um, in countries where indigenous tribes are protected like Ecuador, um, the death rate was uh, very low compared to um, countries where they are under assault, like in Brazil. Um, so the, the, the last year has been very particular um, because of the lack of traveling. And so one of the um, two topics that I've taken and brought to my indigenous friends um, through lots of conversation online is uh, two of the topics that have been touched upon today. Um, one is uh, um, renewable energies. The other one is, uh, although not touched directly, but is this attempt to put about 30% of earth into some kind of a conservation scheme. Um, and what I want to say about this is uh, uh, for the Green New Deal, if you, we, we look at the Green New Deal at a planetary level, um, I will call it, um, you know, based on this great movie, uh, There Will Be Blood. Um, we, we, again, you know, we look at things in a very short term um, views and uh, the problem with this Green New Deal is um, if the source of energy is renewable. The technology that we are using to harness it is not. It's still based on extractive industries. And um, that's, that's going to be, uh, um, it has already happened in Bolivia, but it's going to be uh, um, um, put much more stress on indigenous communities. The same way is putting 30% uh, of uh, planet Earth into this conservation scheme, uh, where the attempt is really to capitalize on nature, so-called natural services, um, that also going to exclude indigenous people. And the thing that we, we, we have a hard time realizing is um, where indigenous people have uh, land rights or customary rights, that's where you'll find the greatest um, biodiversity on Earth. About 80% of uh, biodiversity is found on indigenous land. Right. So there is, there is a complete lack of um, integrating indigenous people into these conversations because it will make us very uncomfortable when we look at the reality of a Green New Deal. So that's, that's my spiel for this morning, and I'm really happy to see you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And um, I just read an article um, in the last week that was about how, as people tried to protect nature, they created wilderness areas, which often push indigenous people off their damned lands, which was terrible. And I have a belief that people who know what they're doing uh, and have good intentions are really good for the landscape. They, they help preserve and enrich the landscape in many different ways. So I think a piece of what you're talking about includes helping custodians of those parts that we want to protect stay on the land and protect the land, as opposed to, I think, many people's idea that, oh, that means we have to just clear these areas and make sure nobody lives in those newly protected lands. I think that, and this is just my own opinion on, on, the, on this thing. 
Uh, oh, no, then... you're, you're absolutely correct, Jerry. And, and that comes back uh, to the late 1900s and John Muir um, and all this push to, to set up this big conservation area in the United States. And, and that model is still in existence. And you can look at what's happening with worldwide farm with uh, nature conservation and so forth, or so these are big NGOs. It's, it's really a, a business. Yeah, it a is. Business. So you set up, you set up a, a, a large area and it's managed by these people and they sell uh, concessions to indigenous people. I mean, just, just the thought of it is, is mind boggling. Um, that happens in Guatemala. Um, so it happens in Africa, it happens in, in um, Southeast Asia. And uh, yeah, so, so it's, um, it's a big problem because uh, we tend to think of wild the nest as wild the nest, while it has mostly been shaped by us. Um, so us, 2000 years before we entered this big uh, uh, change of civilization, but also uh, by indigenous people in the Amazon. You get it, it's man-made. It's, it's lovely, yes. And there, there's a whole long history yeah. of that that I can point to. Before I go to class, one more thing I wanted to add in, which is a friend of ours, Enrique Sala, has a proposal to take 50% of the ocean and make it a marine preserve. In which case, for me, this, this sort of the people don't live sort of in those parts of the ocean. But right now, if you look at a map of marine preserves, they're just little slices here and there. Absolutely. And, and if we actually manage to keep people from fishing 50% of the ocean, uh, the fish abundance would lead to like crazy. Like, you know, there'd be plenty of fish in the other areas to fish out. It's just a matter of how do you control those commons uh, in, a, in a reliable way. But, but if fish knew that they could go over to like quadrant A4 and not be hunted down and they're like, ah, I don't know about Bobby keeps going into quadrant C6 and like they're fish in there. Uh, but something like that, I think would help a lot. Sorry, over to you, Klaus. Yeah, what Mark is saying, uh, George Monbiot uh, is one advocate for uh, rewilding. It's it's pretty controversial in a lot of uh, applications because there is no such thing as nature as it was. You know, before uh, the European settlers traveled uh, into Europe and brought all their domesticated animals in and killed all the buffaloes and basically uh, uh, change the entire ecosystem. So to go back to what is the difficult thing. But it really shows that we have to have a unifying concept, right? We have to have a, a, a plan, a vision, you know, where all these things fit in and have their place so we can then collectively work towards that. And, and to me, that's the big thing missing is there is no common vision as to what this final system really looks like in total, because it has the feet, you know, uh, steering onto 10 billion people. Uh, it has to uh, be done in a sustainable way. Um, and uh, it has to be, we still have to protect nature and the diversity of the natural world. So those are big things um, uh, that, that really require a consolidated uh, 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 discussion, I mean, a consolidating discussion. Yeah, um, and, your, and your group and, and, and what I'm doing, uh, we have a, a lot in common. Um, I'm quite, act, I mean, present or active a little bit on, on, on the Soil for Climate on, on Facebook. Um, so I suppose sometimes I come from a farmer's family and I've seen the, the damage of uh, intensive farming on my family. Uh, lots of cancers, um, you know, soil that is being degraded, has been degraded very rapidly so much so that my cousins who are uh, keeper of the lands now um, have had to go back to restorative methods for the farms. Um, but on, 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 on the bigger picture, if I may, I'm working also with a professor uh, from Kenya called Mordecai Ogada, and he wrote um, this great book. She holds it right in front of you. Yeah. What's it, the big what? The big conservation lie. Thank you. We will look it up and post it in the chat. Yeah, it's a great book. Um, thank, thank you, you so much. Um, thank you. And I wanted to go back 
to Craig's question with my sort of offer to it, which is uh, an observation about more than social media. It's about lots of different sectors. And it's, it's, uh, it's a blanket statement sort of, but capitalism eats and warps really good ideas. And, and here's, here are my notes to myself, just to remember what I wanted to say. Uh, like my wife, did, when I met her, was in microfinance. And microfinance starts with Mohammed, well, one thread of microfinance starts with Mohammed Yunus giving 21 uh, Bangladeshi women, to, uh, you know, 20 bucks worth of a loan that they circulate around the group. There's a whole bunch of really interesting things about it. Its spirit and, and, and direction are great. And then big money and uh, other places get a hold of, of, uh, of it. And suddenly uh, you get into a place a decade later where in India, people are committing suicide because they took one microfinance loan from this entity, then another one from this entity, then another one from this entity to pay that one. And they're now in debt up to their like nostrils and they're killing themselves. And a bunch of other bad things happened in microfinance. But a lot of that happens because it got centralized, massivized, capitalized, and a bunch of things happen there. Uh, Uber is not a, a good example of the sharing economy, but the ideas behind the sharing economy are really great. Uh, so there's all these kinds of ways. And I remember being, I think, uh, I, think uh, I was uh, a, a little bit of an advisor to early Twitter. And I remember the day they got 145 million in VC funding, their first round. And I thought to myself, oh, this is trouble. Like th this is actually going to create more problems than it's worth because it's going to be really hard to advertise and monetize Twitter. If they could only take an open source direction of some sort and put this out as a platform, they might actually change society in productive ways. But this, is, this didn't feel like a, like a big win. And then if you look at the history of radio and TV, um, the early radio sort of pioneers were granted enormous swaths of spectrum for free uh, and then given all kinds of legal protections in order to, because people thought it was going to be very expensive to do all this stuff when in fact um, pirate radios and all that were sort of already burgeoning and it, it isn't that expensive to do these kinds of things. Uh, and so, uh, and then I did, at the end, I was like, oh shit, and copyright laws and the overextension of copyright laws and the overprotection of intellectual property is all part and parcel of this thing. Uh, so uh, sorry for the longish screed on my own uh, part. Uh, we, uh, Jack had to fall off the call and he was in the queue, but uh, I wanted to go to Linda, Vincent and Judy. Uh, and so Linda, yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So a couple of weeks ago, the fear memes that are out there regarding vaccination came my way from two different sources. My best buddy, who uh, I was pestering to get vaccinated, and it seems he had a call with his Republican older brother who influences him, and then he wasn't going to get vaccinated anymore. And a naturopath, very lefty naturopath, who we got an email from, and I'm going to put the file in the chat. Sorry, I don't know how to do matter most. That's okay, we'll copy and paste. Thanks, Linda. You've tried really hard to get on Mattermost and I really appreciate that. There we go. So I wrote, Jerry, will that open? Uh, let's find out. It uh, should be pages. fine. Uh, it's in pages, so it's not really a normal doc. Pete, can we translate pages? Uh, yeah, I'll do it. Thank okay, you thank so you. much, Pete. Anyway, so I wrote Jerry, because I, I thought, well, maybe a place to start answering it you, you know these these memes are out there they're viral they're fear-based and 40 percent of republicans say they're not going to get vaccinated they need to be these claims which i think are pseudoscience need to be answered widely and i don't see that happening um they quote the statistic of all the people who don't want to get vaccinated but the specifics of the memes that are circulating, I have not heard them answered. So I wrote Jerry because I thought somebody in this group is going to know somebody who knows the specifics. And it seems like it would be a good place to start would be with facts. So I wanted to put this out there and see, you know, who has the facts. I mean, claims like it, it'll harm your DNA, it's not effective, um, and a variety of other things like that. So you know, some of them are clearly answerable. You know, it's it's not black or white. It is effective or not effective. It's just uh, the correct answer would be a percentage mm -hmm. you know, in each case. But some of the other ones, I don't have the answers to. So, but just putting that out there in case anybody wants wants to come back or has a place to circulate widely the answers to these extremely viral memes that are out there. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Linda. This, I, I, and I, I love this question, even though I dread this question. It's like, oh my God, what, how did this happen? But how do we get out of it? Pete, go ahead. Um, thanks for highlighting that, Linda. And I've, I've got good news and bad news, mostly bad news, I think. 
Um, this is an interesting question to me, and and I was one of the people who was started like COVID information back in April last year or something like that. And I kind of petered out of, of interest. All the information is out there. It's easy, pretty easy to find actually, you know, truth. The the problem that we've got, especially in the US is truth is not, not an easy concept, right? Um, so uh, thank goodness now we've got Dr. Fauci not being, um, uh, not being thwarted by his boss. Um, my wife, who follows a lot of COVID information intensively, um, is now pretty unhappy with Dr. Fauci because he's not, you know, he's not stepping up to the plate and saying the things that he should say. Um, the the people that she listens to are very, very, very good. Um, kind of long-winded. There's Michael Osterholm and uh, Dr. John. I forget his last name on YouTube. Um, Dr. John literally has been doing every day a amazing long video on on YouTube about anything and everything COVID related. Um, listening to him for a couple of days makes your blood pressure go down, probably prevents COVID. Um, uh, it, it's, um, you know, so the problem isn't information. The problem isn't saying the information. Michael Osterholm will say to, or um, uh, the other guy, uh, now I forget, um, uh, it, the information that out there, it's said a lot. So. I've, I have reflected on why, you know, why Dr. Fauci just doesn't say the right things, you know, and, and, and especially when my wife gets really upset about it, she's, she's like, he should be doing the right thing. I, I think we're in this really complicated situation in the US where saying the right thing is not good enough. Even saying that you're, you know, that other, there, there are people that you should listen to who are saying the right thing. Don't even listen to me because, you know, I'm in the federal government and I guess, I guess you hate the federal government or think we're all stupid or the whole world is upside down and the federal government is out to get you and kill all the children and have God you know, knows what, you know, all of that stuff makes it so that public health, especially in the U.S. where I live and, you know, other places in the world are kind of similar. Public health information is just a nightmare. Um, and saying the right thing is hard and saying that you're going to say the right thing or that somebody else could say the right thing is hard. It just doesn't work. So we're, you know, we're double, triple bound, wound up around um, the former president's, you know, Axel um, still and, and will continue to be so. Um, there is a channel, FYI, there's, <laughs> I'm so sorry to say this, Linda. Um, there is a channel on Mattermost uh, that's actually a, a coronavirus, you know, wisdom channel. Um, a few people post their uh, interesting and useful stuff. As as somebody who's posted interesting and useful stuff, um, I've still got a Substack where you know 100 people subscribe to me saying what I think is important about stuff. I've pretty much dried up. It's like, you know, either either you're kind of like into the right channel and you get the, you know, you, you're you're hearing stuff or you're not ever going to hear stuff. So, you know, there. By the way, thanks, thanks also for this topic and thanks, Linda. Um, the, vari the variants, um, B117, the UK variant, um, they're ravaging Europe right now. Um, and the US is super happy because we're all done with COVID and we can take off our masks and we can, you know, go, go back to amusement parks. So we can go out and have party and, and have fun. That mm -hmm. is us riding on the coattails of the, the previous wave. We are about to hit the new wave. So it's, it's rising now. Um, you know, a month ago, it was the calm before the storm. We're in the storm right now. It's just that the, the exponential growth is, looks like this, right? Unless you're looking very carefully and then it looks like this. But the exponential growth is like this and it's going to be like that and, you know, within a month or so. So uh, take care of yourselves and anybody who will listen to you. Um, take all the precautions that you did in April. It's not better now than it was in summer last year. It is not. It's worse. Um, it's just that we've gotten fatigued and the country as a collective. And surprisingly enough, like even the political infrastructure can't like bring itself to coordinate the fact that this is the time that we really need to be vigilant. You know, it, it's, it's too hard literally too hard to do that in the public sphere in the US. It's amazing. Um, briefly, I think it's really like central to OGM to try to figure out how to demonstrate, show, connect, collect, express these sorts of things, uh, whether it's whether it's climate change, whether it's vaccines, whether it's whatever. I think that's that's sort of core business for us. Uh, but also, 
um, sometimes like it isn't about logic. It isn't about, hey, here's proof of the scientific whatever. It's about emotions and membership and all that kind of stuff. And so I just typed into the chat like, hey, maybe the Lysistrata strategy would work, which is basically a sex strike. Uh, it worked in Liberia. Uh, there's a, you know, there's a nice documentary about the sex strike in Liberia where there were warring factions and the women basically said, y'all don't get, y'all don't find peace. There's no sex for anybody. And they, apparently they're pretty unified on this and it worked and sex doesn't have to be women against men. It can be any side. So one could say, uh, unless vaccine, mm, no intimacy or whatever. And maybe that bridges groups. I don't know. It, it, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of silly, but kind of serious. Uh, my favorite social change strategy is taking a friend by the hand to try something new. And so, so if we have friends who will take us in to just, hey, I've got a double date for vaccination set up on Tuesday, uh, let's go do it perhaps, maybe that does it, don't know. But, but maybe there are social hacks, and maybe this goes back to social platforms as well, um, that can help us bridge some of these gaps because just trying to make our way through the logic ignores the fact that most of these people are at the far side, or many of these people, surprisingly many, are at the far side of the spectrum Pete was describing, which is like, the government is out to get me, they're going to chip me, uh, nobody's trustworthy, uh, everybody's lying, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and that's a desperate place that we've sort of gotten ourselves into. Uh, Linda, did you, did you want to jump back in? Okay. I'm done. Um, cool. Mark? Yeah, I, I also want to when, when we say that, um, get to also uh, keep in mind um, that if people don't trust the government, it's not just because they are fake news or because we had Donald Trump for four years. Um, it's also because uh, a lot of people feel that the government has uh, let them down. Yeah, and, and in many ways, it has. I mean, it's, 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 it's really interesting, right? It, it don't, totally has. Um, we're running out of time. Uh, a couple of us have to bolt in about seven or eight minutes, but let's go Vincent, Judy, Joe, and see how far we get. Thanks, Jerry. I'll try to be quick. Um, so I am finding the new energy to jumping back into the shared calendar project, hopefully with some others now. And if anyone else is interested in joining, um, shoot us a message in the matter most. I don't know if we have a channel, um, but the main flotilla. issue, that, yeah, the flotilla channel. Um, and the main issue that we were having before was with reoccurring events syncing up with the, the calendar. Um, and so um, hopefully within the week, we'll have that fixed and have some updates by next week. Um, also in terms of flotilla um, and particularly with the project that I've been stewarding Catalyst, um, I've been making some really good progress on people and project profiles, um, which can be used across communities and also hopefully for the COP climate event to start to kind of map out different climate projects and how people can get involved. Um, and so the kind of like last two points I have uh, in, in regards to this last conversation, I just wanted to bring in the term precautionary principle. Uh, which is approach to innovations with the potential for causing harm when our knowledge is kind of lacking. And I really wish as a society, we, we actually took that principle into some sort of action. And I feel like it's a lot easier to prevent problems from happening that can be easily predicted than trying to like put band-aids and solve it after it's spun out of control. And like where where is the department of precautionary principles in our government right like i feel like that's the entire purpose of government and yet i feel like it's a principle that's not even like vaguely uh acted on um the last point is like i'm wondering if anyone knows if there's a global accounting system for like what are all of the things we need to do i know there's the scgs and then below that there's like the metrics but is there like a master list of all of the numbers that we need to hit in order to basically like in one easy clear place that you could then also connect it to projects and say okay if this project's successful it's going to chop down one percent of the carbon budget in order to stay at a certain part per million i just feel like the scale of the problem is so up in the air and it's not very clear and tangible to me and it's something that i feel like has very hard fixed constraints like our planet is deterministic we have some like constraints there in some ways it's, um but 
yeah, I'm wondering if anyone has information about that. Um, Vincent, I'm done speaking. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Vincent. Uh, go ahead, Pete. Welcome, Ray, and thank you for, for joining us. We'll, um, uh, glad, you're, glad you're here. Sorry that we're slow in getting to you and to say hi. I just wanted to say hi right now. Um, go ahead, Pete. Um, I, uh, thank you for asking that question, Vincent. And, and in, in my small slice of knowledge of the world, I don't know of such a thing. And the things that I know of that are kind of towards the such a thing start to have um, uh, bias, uh, essentially personal bias, very, very, very quickly. So anything that collects a lot of information starts to get super biased, um, and it's not general generalizable. But I, I would, I would have a plea for this group. Um, most people, if they ask the question, "Can we track all the things?" Um, I would say, yeah, whatever, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. You've just grasped uh, boiling the ocean, a uh, boiling the ocean problem. If anybody can solve this in the world, it's Vincent. Um, if we can give them all the help that we can on how do we metricize everything and understand the, the levers and the balances, Vincent is the, the guy that could kind of um, organize all of that some, somehow. He's magic at that. And, and um, it, it would be a great effort so um love that and um a friend of mine andy this is this is off track for what you're saying vincent but in the long run it, it's absolutely not a friend of mine andy maffey inspired by a different guy who was slightly uh, uh i don't know where but had looked at bookkeeping and most companies are keeping three or four kinds of books and different sets of books. They've got sort of their tax books, they've got their manufacturing books, they've got the material that they're tracking, they're doing all these and they don't really tie together. And the kind of accounting that Andy was working on was, was actually sort of an energy exchange accounting where a single transaction could play out and could register in one place all those different aspects of what's happening uh, in really, really interesting ways. And he's not a coder and he was struggling and this has been going on for a decade or more, probably 15 years, <clears throat> but, it's, but it's actually really fascinating. Uh, so anybody who wants to know, just send me an email and say Andy Maffei and I'll connect you with him and see where, where he is. But, but the, the idea was that if he could deliver the system he was working on, then when you talk SDGs and when you talk Wall Street, you'd be working from the same set of books uh, that understood how those transactions actually interacted. Uh, and that, that being said, I think Vincent, the thing you're looking for and the thing he's that, that Andy's working on, that the, the capillary systems and the interactions between all these systems are so complicated that they will, they will be hard to, you know, they won't yield easily to accounting uh, innovations or accounting systems. So we've got to figure out how else to do this, <clears throat> but, um, but thank you. And we've only got a, like a, a minute or so uh, left uh, in our call. Uh, so how about Judy, do you want to do a real quick check-in? Um, <clears throat> great call, love to see the new faces because it helps enrich our group, <clears throat> excuse me. I've been busy on a lot of collective intelligence stuff, working with a number of you on side projects and we'll defer to another time, thanks. Sounds awesome, thanks Judy. Um, <coughs> and, and Joe, do you wanna check in? We still have a, like a minute or two. Yeah, sure, just to say, um, you know, this is an interesting call with lots of different ideas going around. I, I um, like Doug's point about the people evolving alongside the technology. I would say this seems to be more like the people evolving part. And I hope that we can follow up more about the technology evolving part, perhaps in a different call. But I think, yeah, there was a lot of excitement from uh, me and Leo. I don't know that we had an after 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 party because we were too tired, but we did carry on the discussion the next day. So I just wanted to mention that excitement, uh, whether that happens sort of on your side as part of CSC or on our side, I should tag in that we have a, a Discord where we're on there all the time. Um, and so there's another place where people who want to engage probably more on the technical side could uh, find me and Leo regularly. And then, yes, as Charlotte said, a plug for Pure.gy later today and kind of ongoing as and when there's time. So um, it's a bit vague, but yeah, just summary, interested in following up on the technical side for these things. Well, thank you. Um, Ray, would you like to take a second and just introduce yourself? And, and I think it's, it's fun that you found your way here. I'm glad you liked the conversation. I'm curious how, how things connected. Oh, um, it, uh, yeah. It might be Eric Willikens if he's in this oh, group. Oh yeah, he's just not on this call, but he's in this group. 
Right. Okay. Now it all makes sense because I was expecting a call with him, and then suddenly this interesting conversation. Oh. <laughs> um, so I uh, uh, I'm a refugee from from climate work. I now work on global catastrophic risk, specifically on the food system and things that could happen to break it up in the next twenty years. Uh, so we look at ways to recover food supplies. Very quite pragmatic and connected to the effective altruism movement. We have a lot of um, volunteers from there. So we've got a 501c3 and we're setting up in the UK. I'm calling from Oxford, although I'm often in South Asia. Um, and I've also been pretty involved with nonviolent communication. Um, Brilliant. We have so many overlaps with the work we do and uh, some areas that we're not talking enough about. So I'm uh, really thrilled you found us by mistake even. Well, nuclear is still an issue and volcanoes will definitely happen. So those are the ones that, uh, I like volcanic example because it's, we've got good research in the UK and volcanologists really love volcanoes. <laughs> exactly, to what's not to love? Um, we have to fold the call. It's been uh, lovely. Thank you all for being here. Uh, show up tomorrow at 8. I'm going to send the invite a little later, later today, but book 8 a.m. tomorrow if you'd like to talk about what OGM is and like do the blind men and the elephant exercise and uh, see, you, see you then. Thanks, everybody. Is the person who asked about the precautionary principle still here? I am. Hi. Hi. There's a problem with the precautionary principle. It, there's an unlimited number of things you could take precautions for, and you would spend <laughs> all your budgets preventing things and nothing, do nothing positive. That's the main difficulty. So you, you have to do a combination of basic duty of care, prevention, preparedness, resilience, recovery, you know, horses for courses. You, you can't, Obviously, every time something bad happens, people say we should have the precautionary principle, but you can't. You just you just can't do it for everything. So you you know you you can do it for volcanoes, which makes more sense than doing it for comets because comets are vanishingly rare, and and there's not much you could do anyway. Whereas there's quite a bit you can do for vol volcanic preparedness. I agree. I think um, yeah, there's definitely a balance, um, and I think we are way on one side of that <laughs> balance at the moment. But in terms of the well, precaution, with viruses, with viruses, obviously. I mean, when, when you look at what's been spent on dealing with the pandemic, it's blindingly obvious to everyone that yeah. early early monitoring and and lockdown would have been ideal. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I I think. Um, I, d I just feel like it's something that, um, like when I learned it in school, I was like, this seems so obvious. And yet it seems like just a concept that doesn't even like permeate through the kind of like culture of like, like, like obviously we should prevent problems instead of trying to solve them when it's too late. Um, it, and so there's like the cultural for it. It does if you concentrate on the physical and, and biological sciences. But if you do the humanities and the politics and the communication and the prioritization and the economics, it, it starts to look a bit different of what's the most worth thing, what's the thing we should do first becomes the question rather than what's worth doing because everything's worth doing. Yeah, I think the one thing that I've been thinking about lately, um, so I was listening to a Daniel Schmachtenberger talk and he was talking about how um, with like progress of innovation, technological innovation, um, most technological innovations end up creating more, that solve a problem, end up creating more problems, right? So like the car solved transportation problem, but it causes other, like three or four other problems. Um, mm -hmm. And when you have basically, like, I don't think that that, I agree with him that I don't think that can go on. Like we cannot continue to progress at the same rate technologically, and that, that, that's, that's only true if the analysis is complete but but that in healthcare that would be true but life span has still been increasing until very recently i mean you could argue about it now right so it's not I, no single equation that explains the whole of reality that you then say nothing else is going on so we've got to deal with this one equation you can do that for biomass of humans if that's if you analyze the world looking at just mammalian biomass 
it looks terrible, but it's not permanent. It's not the only thing that's going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think in terms of like, uh, it depends definitely on the, the industry. Um, I guess what I'm saying is I think if we were to like slow, the pace of technological innovation and advancement seems to me very much out of sync with our pace to like govern, to catch up socially and culturally. And so I think low down the progress to allow for more of a balance in precaution of development to make sure that things we are progressing in a way that is not creating more negative externalities than it is creating but positive. How? how? What's the okay, what's the science what's the implementation science and the economic science that makes what you're proposing possible? So if you if you, if you start with the tractability of it, you're never gonna do that because you can't stop people can't stop the Chinese progressing with technology. What you can do is try to improve governance. And even that that's is, difficult, but at least yeah. it's possible. You know, it does happen, does seem to happen over time. You know, economically, we seem to be more competent than we were in the 1930s. Yeah, I guess, I, I mean, if the, accounting systems that we have for our economics are solely based off of growth, then you're right. It's, there's no reason to not slow. There's no reason to slow down. I think if you were to take the approach of having different metrics, like, okay, like if, like I could make, if you give me a year um, and like I could do <laughs> massive amounts of research, I could probably present a pretty good argument that if we slow down technological growth, um, by incorporating more precautionary principle within innovation that is able to then focus the progress on certain innovations that have a higher potential that, to do more good and less negative in like a very systemic way, then I would argue you, you could, you know, take metrics like happiness or environmental sustainability, and those metrics would be higher than your GDP. And obviously, I'd like, like to lock you in a room with some cynical people from the CIA for a week to under, to sort of get some handles on how they look at influencing what really happens in the world. Because they're, they're very, very hard headed people. John is going to come in on. Well, this. I, you, you know, I, I you guys are having a, a kind of a default private room here at the end of Jerry. And I stuck around because I, I really like what you're saying. Uh, so I hope that's OK. Yeah, yeah. Fine. And, this this is not an answer uh, in, in you know answer in the complete sense. Um, I know about the the room of CIA guys and, and or, the, or the room of cynics and how that would sound. Um, I had this kind of transforming experience uh, by doing these short uh, 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 participatory budgeting things, and they weren't full. They weren't full, they were partial. So they would, in other words, we, we get a bunch of people, a, a really good random group. We, we take the table, we, we have the budget for the city. We divide it up by number of people table. We hand them the play money and we put a time limit on it. And we say, okay, here's the program. Here's what we're doing now. What do you think more or less? Mm -hmm. More for this or less for this? So it's, it's not, the purists of participatory budgeting hate this. They think it's terrible. And the purists of random selection hate this. They say, no, 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 you didn't randomize the people. There's all going to be able to criticize it. But it had this wonderful effect of pulling people out of their, uh, it didn't destroy their passion, but like passion isn't going to do it. Intensity is not going to do it. You got you got stuff in your hand. You got dollars in your hand. Where are you going to put them? In, and having put them down, it's, it's a recommendation. It's not a final decision. You put it down, that's a recommendation. Then you hear back later from the government that says, we accept your recommendation or we're gonna have to say, no, here's why. Yeah. But the, the satisfaction that comes from, oh, I was heard, I put it down, this is what happened. I think yeah. that's actually the future of governance and there's no yeah. reason not to do it now. We don't, we don't have to send representatives to, to an electoral college across the continent to make decisions anymore. It, it, we're using a... Yeah. Well, I, I've read the whole, and you probably have too, the whole liquid democracy uh, conversation. And it's, it's wonderfully idealistic and it works for the whatever percent it is, is it 2%, 5% of the people who are so into the 
exquisite rationality <laughs> of, of, you know, that works for them, but it won't work for everybody else. So, so. Well, how it actually happens, it's like the Young Turks. I'm thinking of Vincent is a bit like one of the Young Turks with, you know, this perfectly designed ethical way and this new Turkey that's going to happen. And then along comes Ataturk and sure. takes guns and, and uh, you know, canon from the British and the French and actually creates the new Turkey and right. sweeps us up the Young Turks. Right. Takes one or two more ideas, but not yeah. many. Yeah. That's, that's how change, you know, and the CIA know this perfectly well. They replace the regimes as and when it suits them. It's probably, they probably do it online now mm -hmm. um, in ways. That but they have very smart people. They do look at how the world works. And the reason lots of countries are paranoid about them is that they are remarkably effective when they want to be. Well, do, do, do you, would you agree though, that they have um, had to come to terms with much greater, uh, uh, being much more circumscribed in terms of what they're able to do? Well, I'm sure they're much more subtle now. Than <laughs> yeah, but I mean, not just subtle, not just subtle, but they, they realize they can't, have the effect they would have had in the past and also that you know there's other big players doing disinformation i don't know how to assess it i only have one real world example which is that there was a cyclone in in madagascar that cut off the south of the island so yeah. the cia guy from the embassy was dropped in in the south from a helicopter with a rucksack full of money and a water filter and a thermo rest he didn't even speak French, let alone Malagasy, but he set up a yeah. tent. He got someone to make a tent for him. He sat down with his rucksack of money and he got the roads reopened. You know, people, he sent yeah. people, he paid people, you get through to the capital, I don't care how you do it. This is how much you pay and this is the message I want you to take. So he, got, and you know, that created a path and that became a track and then eventually a vehicle could cross it. And that's, that's how he worked. I mean, they, and so they're, they're probably it's quite a it's a great example. It's it's the exception that proves the rule in the sense of, do you need a cycle? You know, in other words, you have to knock all the competing forces down for that force <laughs> to have true. as much power yeah. as it well, does. He did go into effectively a terra incognita. Yeah, exactly. He yeah. Only, he was until he got basically his job was to get the WFP in. Um, so, but until that, he was the only power in town. So yeah. Right. yeah. And in in a messier real life situation with multiple forces. I mean, the, the other the other example that comes to me in yeah, terms of the- That's what they're so good. They're so good at picking out where they can have an, an yeah. impact. Uh, and and I don't think, they, did they try with Brexit? I mean, <laughs> I don't know what your feelings are about it. Mine is that it was, it would have been close anyway, and it's possible that the Russians tipped it. I don't think anybody expected until, until the night itself, I don't think anybody Thought that they would win, except one or two maniac Brexiteers. I mean, not the sensible ones. They thought they would lose. Yeah. So, do you do you think do you think? Uh, I'm sure the Russians. Subsidized, you think subsidized disinformation? They expected. To yeah. Win. <laughs> do you think subsidized disinformation, i.e., Russians and others, had a decide could could have had a deciding? I think it more like decades of Rupert Murdoch. Yeah. You know, okay. All right, all right. Especially in the north of England, you know. Right, on right. England. So that go comes back to the idea of nurturing resilient self-governance in, in groups of people so that they become not immune, but more resistant. So, I mean, if they have, if they have many, many positive experiences, I got together with a group, we had money in our hands, you know, funny money. We used the funny money, like you had to pay to forward information. You had to pay to like something. But with this funny money, which I'm more willing to spend, I wouldn't spend my own money, but I would sure. spend this funny money that you gave me. You couldn't do it with limited amounts of real money. In yeah. I mean, in other words, the funny money at the end of the game, you get something of real value. You can't convert it into dollars or pounds. There is something called the money game, which I've done yeah. with real cash. But it, yeah. the, the brief is that you come into the workshop with the amount of money you could afford to lose. Yeah. Pain. And then it is real money, and you, you do walk away with, um, you know, what what you, what you. Yeah. So there's a dial here. There's a dial between fiat, a real currency, yeah. and yeah. and completely <laughs> fake currency. Sort of finding the right balance between learning and experience. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's not it's not real money. I mean, that's a different game. That might be valuable, but that's one kind of game. And there's a completely fake thing, and that's too idealistic. 
I think people have, to, you give them funny money that says funny money on it, but they have in their heads that at, at certain point, I'm going to, you know, there's going to be prizes. There's going to be something of value that comes to me based on how, how uh, my participation in the game. Did I, did I, Wait, did I value things? What's that? Schools could and should become self-governing. I mean, my school was governed by old boys. It's a charity school. Yeah. And so yeah. the board of governors is old boys. And they are just way out of date, just like parents are terrible governors sure. for school. Yeah. Right. I, I would guess that the people who should be making the syllabus are, are 14 year olds. Or at, have least, better or at least having the kind of input. What's coming and what they can <laughs> enjoy and find useful than any careers advisor. I mean, the, when, I, when I remember the, the lectures we had on careers, ah. it was so out of date and such bad advice we were given. <laughs> you know, uh, they were, disc they, they were in, I, I mean, this is a real example from 1984, I think they said, no, don't do computing, do do electronic engineering and don't do graphic design or art, which was completely the wrong advice. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. couldn't have been more wrong. <laughs> So, so listen, I'm going to have I'm going to have to go. But uh, Ray, I would like to stay in touch with you. Uh, are you on Mattermost? Can you? Can, are I don't you even on, know what it is. I'm a bit okay. surprised. Okay. Can you? Uh, yeah, I can invite you, Ray. And yeah, I'll, or just give me just give me your email, or I can give you mine. I just like to. Okay, I'm sure. Yeah. Follow um, up. My main means of intellectual <laughs> exchange is Facebook. Actually, uh, I'm in a lot of groups there. Okay. Well, I, I don't use it except under under duress, but <laughs> Ray, <laughs> Ray at all, all info. Hi, Eric. I, I guess it was you that got me into this. Yes, I did. <laughs> what happened happens? actually? Because it's it's a quarter to ah oh, yeah, it's the daylight savings time thing. No, they they had to end early at a half ah. hour, um, but we stayed on because uh, Ray asked me about. The precautionary principle, and we started. Uh, <laughs> we started. <laughs> and I stuck around because I said, "Oh, this is going to be good." <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, nice to see you, Eric. Um, yeah, same. I wasn't okay. meeting by the way. The, it was shorter, but. Yep. Oh, um. Uh, I mean the the OGM meeting. How was it? Oh, it was great. It was good. But with the usual the usual constraints of fascinating question gets raised, interesting points get made, ten other interesting points. Oops, squeezed, don't have moved. Yeah. <laughs> oops, oops, oops. Next. Okay, you know. Okay, let's not divert too much there and bring it back to something else. <laughs> Same yeah, exactly. Something like that. So, unfortunately, I do have to go. Ray, is it is it all Fred or all fed? What was that? All fed. All fed dot info. A L L F E D dot info. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'll, that, and that's an email, so right. Yeah. So I'll send you an email with my email, and I, I only have a few more questions about um, the effect of altruism work, and the, I mean, yeah, but also it's I really like the. Uh, so Oxford, the Center for Effective Altruism. Yeah, uh, I I read the basic stuff that comes from okay. there, and and that's good. That's a good start. Uh, I'll, I'll ask a secondary question, maybe, and uh, I'll share what I'm doing, and uh, you know, and so on. But I really like the the uh, hard-earned wisdom that you bring to your comments. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I tried to become more pragmatic over time. Yes, yes. Well, we don't have infinite time left, so that's that. It's very practical to get more uh, practical <laughs> as as the time comes <laughs> out certainly if you deal with risk management <laughs> yeah, exactly exactly uh, precautionary principle about death okay yep good to see you all continue bye. if you like yeah, and bye. Uh, i'll see you at a future uh, future event bye john see you later bye bye but i did put some alternatives to the precautionary principle in the chat i don't know if you saw that um oh man is that the zoom chat that we still have here? Yes. Let me take a look. I, mean, I don't know if you want alternatives to the precautionary principle. Um, was it tipping points info? Oh, never no, mind. Um, duty of care, preparedness and resilience work, um, early warning, DRR and response planning, the first things that occurred to me. And general, 
you know, vulnerability analysis and what, uh, but vulnerability analysis is, I think, the most promising area because you can't predict reliably what's going to happen, but you can do a robust assessment of vulnerabilities and loss of function. So, right. And so especially useful for somewhere like the UK where we can lose ports. So in terms of something like, um, like AI or um, would vulnerability um, analysis be a good tool to be able to use to determine like what sort of legislation and um, like limitations oh. should be put on tech development or would that be more towards like specific strategy for a, a context, a situation, a, uh, yeah. So AI is a, is a special case. Firstly, it's an imaginary, it's partly real and already with us and partly an imagined negative future, which again is unlimited in the, the total number of imagined negative futures. Um, so, I mean, I think the realistic problem with AI is with existing, in combination with existing weaponry and, and nukes, the, the, the usual risks, which are already a risk even without AI. I think it's um, that and ownership, um, depending on yeah. ownership of that technology and the, the lock-in of the kind of like intellectual property plus the resources well, I, to I'm, deploy you're it. You're asking that I'm not, I'm not really an AI safety expert. There are people at, at CSER or an, an FHI in Oxford and Cambridge and the Berkeley's existential risk people. So that there's, I'm, I'm happy there's quite a lot of work now on AI risk. Yeah, um, I feel a little bit like the Millennium Bug. You know, it might be a problem, and lots of people, more people, are working on it now. Whereas nuclear risk between India and Pakistan could easily happen in the next two years. It's funny. I agree with you. I guess on like a very gut level, I feel like there's nothing I can do about nuclear, so I don't even think about it. I don't know if that's. No, weird. I think that's. I think there's a lot more we can do about it. I mean, first we can, I mean, the most robust thing of all is that we can be sure that we can recover from it. So recover right. the, food, the food system, which would be affected because of atmospheric effects, like a volcano. But and hasn't there always been like nuclear threat before? And, and it's always been this kind of, yeah, oh yeah, my- Just because uh, it's around a long time doesn't mean that it's gone away or we don't should stop work. Just like the pandemic. No, no, no was always there. No. Well, the biggest arsenal for sure is in the US, so it's, yeah, it's yeah. always gonna I mean, be. The, the, all out, the all out risk is obviously worse still with US and Russia, but there's a lot more ways that a regional problem could accident or conflict or fake incident could happen. There's a lot more routes that a regional nuclear conflict could happen. So the risk of that is considered much higher, especially India, Pakistan, but you know, Israel as well, mm. Middle East. Yeah. A yeah, dirty can... bomb is considered a higher risk. You know, that's not a nuclear fission event. It's the spread of radioactivity. Right. Well, how did it come up actually? Vincent mentioned precautionary principle. Mm. Uh, he, I think he he thinks technology is always going to produce more problems than it solves, and I was challenging that. Mm. Yeah, I think um, depending on the technology, on a case by case basis, um, if you put a group of interdisciplinary systems thinkers in a room, you could probably evaluate with pretty good accuracy whether or not it's going to be more likely to have negative more negative consequences than positive. Um, like for example, the TV, when the TV was invented by the entire design of it being a one-way medium, you could kind of predict the sort of impacts it will have on culture and society to think, some degree because there's, there's like constraints and limitations in terms of where it can develop. I think all of your answers are gonna depend on how you define negative and positive in the first place. Agreed. Because if, um, you, if, you're, if you use as a sort of naturalistic uh, rural idyll, then of course you hate all of technology. If you, if you want- I'm not a 
and I have a degree in engineering. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think your good bad dichotomy is is questionable. I mean, the simplest one is probably life expectancy, and there it's going to be a mixed picture for a while. Yeah, I think, I think my metrics are life expectancy, um, like sustainability, um, like on a planetary scale, but also like just the environment quality locally as well. Um, inequality in terms of like income. And the other, the other thing you might be forgetting is the deep time perspective. So on a million year time scale, then we're, we're in trouble. You know, the sun will get hotter and, and, and we'll have to move yeah, to Mars. That's a, that's a while, right? Somewhere. So on that basis, the faster we develop all our technologies, the better, because they would give us some hope of terraforming Mars. I'm yeah, but I mean, a AI is something you, the, the issue I think with AI is that we don't really understand how it works. We create it, but then we don't really understand the, the, so the, the, most, like, the most interesting the, the way with it. Uh, huh? The most interesting AI safety work that I've heard is, is they, they basically explained the problem is when you tell, it's like with Frankenstein and the golem, yeah. if you don't understand what you're telling the machine to do, um, it's bound to do something completely stupid because you didn't even understand the, the, the task you were asking it to complete. So, so therefore, AI should be good at second guessing what we ask it to do so that it doesn't end the world or end all life or da 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 da. So, so actually teaching AIs not to take humans too literally <laughs> could be an important safety uh, thing. You know, go and kill a whiskey, whatever it takes, is exactly the wrong instruction if the machine interprets it as kill everybody if that's what it takes. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm less worried about robots like killing us because of some like weird wiring and, and programming. I'm more concerned, honestly, about the like inequality that will come if a very small percentage of the population is able to own the technology that produces most of the kind of like basic necessities and thereby yeah, reducing the power are, of labor. That's already what we have. Labor still is, still has a chance to have some power now, whereas it might not in mm. five to 10 years once Amazon figures sure, out but, how to a, a pick and pick. <laughs> you can see the curve you know in the past it was always big wars that flattened the, the economic playing field and it gave people a fresh start but now there's nothing you know we don't have those kinds of wars anymore and and the rich can just keep getting richer indefinitely unless you decommodify um the things that are necessities to be owned more cooperatively and that sure. includes the automation technology but how do you get there that's back to my original challenge which is what's the tractability of it i think the tractability is using the kind of current leverage points in in the uh, example of land against the system to be able to shift so for example oh. let's uh right now you have um a situation in the u.s where land ownership is very much concentrated and so if you could have people pull their resources, create, this is just like one example of one method. If you have groups of people and groups of a hundred pull together their resources, start a company, take out a loan um, uh, collectively. But, but, but I noticed an if in there, what's the, what's the how of, of getting it started? It's already starting. Like uh, sort of cooperative groups? Yeah, yeah, like cooperative land trusts and cooperative land ownership, it, mostly in the in Europe right now, in the UK, in uh -huh. Spain. So people are basically buying the land that they are being rented for three grand a month, and instead they're owning it and renting it back to themselves below market value, and yeah. saving two times on their rent. They also have ownership collectively over the land, so they're they have incentive to be able to treat it better um, in the long term if they're going to be raising their kids there. And on top of that, it is something that is doable within the current market system. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's, that's one idea. Um, it's nice, but uh, um, I'm looking for something more scalable, I think. 
What is scalable, really? Scalable what do you mean? implementation <laughs> science. It, it's it's something that. Yeah, I know what scalable means, but I I'm I'm wondering why it wouldn't be scalable. So what I notice is that the big changes come in a crisis. Um, a crisis is, is a big driver of change. You have to. Right. You know, so we've seen governments pull out an awful lot during the credit crunch and, and during the pandemic because they had to. They, you know, the amounts of money that they've suddenly discovered that they can spend is astonishing. You know, when, when before you, you couldn't afford to increase childcare slightly and suddenly there's all this money. Oh, that's interesting. So where was all that money before? Well, it was waiting. <laughs> yeah was waiting for a crisis. So it's, I think a lot of what makes change happen is being ready with the solutions when they're needed in a crisis, which is pretty much how we set up all fed. We're assuming that at some point there will be a, a crisis affecting the food system. So we are trying to put in place engineering solutions that, that stop millions from starving. And that's a one time only deal. I hope, you know, I don't think you could keep doing that because eventually you get a degraded diet. And But hopefully through that crisis, we will see that the world needs better governance. So more so, fundamental solutions like you guys discuss here. I think the COVID crisis did start the laying the foundation work of the like the relationships to be able to actually do that at scale. For example, the rise of mutual aid groups, which was one example of um, cooperative forms of governance outside of the current um, systems for which people group? to uh, mutual aid groups. Sure, sure. Uh, oh, yeah, so I mean that, that like, for example, the relation, like I'm part of a, a mutual aid group on Long Island. So it's a network of about 50 nonprofit groups. And um, basically we've been doing uh, food deliveries and doing a lot of work with also policy and advocacy in kind of like using our collective power to also get legislation passed. But we are kind of forming the entity in a way that for the next crisis, we are ready and have the more resilient right. relationship to be able to implement the ideas that we have laying around faster than the government was able to implement anything when COVID hit. The same thing with Sandy. When Sandy hit here, it's, yeah, it's this typical like shock doctrine, like whatever kind of is laying around gets we might, passed. We might be interested in talking to you about food deficit scenarios and what you could do to effectively manufacture your own food in an emergency. Um, have you got any industry in Long Island? Um, so I actually am in the food industry myself. Um, I had a meeting <laughs> with Wakefern, which is the buyer for the ShopRite supermarkets in the U S but it got canceled. It got moved to next week. So that's why we're here or else I would be pitching, uh, my family actually, my family in Italy makes uh, like gluten-free organic pasta. Um, well, interestingly, I'm more interested in the card. <laughs> Do you have a, a factory that makes the packaging on Long Island? Um, we don't have, okay. no, we, we, we don't we do the packaging. We, we outsource the packaging. Um, Paper? We, we used in Italy also have some local facilities where we pack here. So depending on what you want, I might know someone. Um, so, and I also uh, and paper, paper, a paper factory can can handle solids and liquids. So you can cellulosically digest almost anything that's made of carbon, and um, and then you can produce sugars. So mm. in an emergency, you've got a source of, uh, and and it's a non-food source. So you're not taking existing food and and changing it into food. You're taking non-food items, and making them into food. So that would be one of the emergency things, but it, the retrofit would take, without preparation, would take five to six months. So we'd like to reduce that so that it would be useful in an emergency. Flex. Is, that, is, that the, is that the main focus of all fed is kind of like the- That, that kind of thing. How do, you, how do you improvise food in a crisis so that most I, people don't die? I, I, I have to appreciate here that this conversation is the way it's going. Was it's impossible to predict it? <laughs> it's completely impossible. Uh, I always bring it around. You bring on a yeah. subject, and then the way you tackle it is completely like 
wow, that came from. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah no, this is not, this is like a fundamentally better world. This is like a holding action. Um, but the, the part of it which is good is that, you know, it works even better if countries cooperate. So if, it's, if it adds to that general feeling of we get through it all together or we all die, then great. Maybe that would be a slightly transformative aspect. Yeah. I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the kind of like um, aquaponic, hydroponic. Um, very, local very expensive. Oh. And it produces quite small quantities and, and at very high cost. So, you know, very, that's a very specialized kind of NASA end of things. What, yeah, what, I, we're, not, what we're looking for is that the cheap stuff that you can, you know, quickly retrofit what you've already got or methane, protein, back, you know, um, cyanotic bacteria, uh, things, things like that. Th there are good reasons for doing it now because you don't have to cut down the Amazon to produce soya to make beef burgers. Yeah. Um, it's, I'm Italian, so I like my zucchini and eggplant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's great. Um, well, I mean, greenhouses could would have some value, especially on the, the vitamin vegetable end of things. Yeah, I just met um, the founder of, have you heard of My Grow Bot? Um, no. I'll send the link. It's a pretty cool... Um, Apparently they are able to grow with these like small units. It's either indoor or outdoor, um, a salad a day, which is very interesting because um, it, it's pretty fast. Um, and I think they're like under $200 um, upfront cost. And then it produces a salad a day and you could put it outside and have it run with no like electricity um, or you could have it indoor under a, a grow light obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so we're, that's the kind of Rolls Royce end and we're, we're down at the um, Volkswagen end, I think, or the bicycle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, you don't ever know if that technology would hold something or not. The second? Maybe there's a principle in the technology that you could use on a cheaper scale. Well, so yeah, we're, we're looking at polytunnels and uh, low cost greenhouse ramp up for cold shocks. So that's volcanic or nuclear scenarios. Wow. Um, yeah. Okay, I think I'm done for now. Um, so I'll leave you. <laughs> Cheers. Pretty really funny. Uh, I was I was wondering if uh, if you would be the on there, because I saw in my agenda, I added Ray, and then I see four people, one of them being you. <laughs> it's really funny because it's like, yeah. uh, not I was expecting I expect. to see only you, and there were all these other people. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. see you later. Ray. Yeah. All right. <laughs> hey, Vincent. <laughs> on, oh, so you know, how do you know Ray? Um, he's, I know him from Nomad Communication. He's been in festivals and he's, he runs a lot of, Facebook groups on MVC that's kind of support groups. It's kind of a quite a good, um, he's not your run in the mill community manager, but he does it for a long time already and he has running groups. So it's working actually. He's, he's, a, cool. he's got a mind that's very associative and, um, but it's, uh, yeah. And he's, he's also someone who really thinks further away than the general person. like. And we see people can be very ideological and stick to their methods. It is also one of those guys that thinks more systemically. And then I started talking to him more, more some, a few times when there were, either was a crisis in one of those groups or just for interest's sake. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, he seems like a cool guy. Yeah, he is. <laughs> I think we're recording. Um, mm. And I don't know if this room is available, but I can chat for a bit if you want uh yeah i don't know if it, can we stop the recording i don't know actually no probably uh um, is anyone host anymore <laughs> i have no idea um i can also set up another room but yeah okay that's oh i can 
Uh, no, I, I can't unless I have a key. So I think we should probably just stop the recording. Um, if you want to hop back in a Zoom room, if you want to chat for a bit, send me a link. Yeah, listen, uh, I, I'll, um, I'll uh, give you a link in what? In Telegram. Great. Okay. See you soon. Okay. See you later.